anybody in the Catholic Church read this book? Because if you did, you'd find out that there's a lot of stuff that you're being indoctrinated with. Now, I'm not just picking on the Catholics. There's a lot of Protestant churches that are doing other stuff. And that's why it's important to have someone teach, to become a learner, and to study the Word. <laughs>
And the answer to that is yes, absolutely. When you entertain grafting on world ideology to make it more appealing to the masses, what you've done is you've just done what the church did between 100 and 325 AD. You just started grafting on paganistic, heathen, whatever, just to bring the masses together, and it, 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 it does not line up with the scriptures. So the first thing, as I said, I'm taking you to the Great Commission for a purpose. I want to show you a couple of things in here, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hone in on two words that I've honed in before on this passage, but for a completely different reason. So let me start kind of in a logical place, verse 16. So Matthew 28, verse 16. Then the 11 disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain, where Jesus had appointed them. So obviously this is after his resurrection. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. All right. So I want to hone in on two words. If you want to circle them in your Bible, they will be teach from verse 19 and teaching from verse 20. You may, you may already have notes on this, I'm not certain. But here's the first word for teach and the second word teaching. Now, even if you don't read or speak Greek, you can see these are two separate and distinct words. So let's talk a little bit about what's going on here. Un, which translates therefore. See, so your King James starts with Go ye therefore. So we have the directive to go, therefore. And this word here, mathetusate, which is, and I've taught on this before, to make disciples or learners. And the difference between, I'll just do this now, the difference between the first word, mathetusate, which is, and I'll, I'll, I have some notes, so I'll read them to you, but the difference between these two words and didascuntes. Didascuntes, we get our, for example, didash, didactic, teaching, instruction. So they are similar words, but they are not synonyms per se. And I'll go on to explain in just a minute here. So first and foremost, this particle right here, un, therefore, an illative particle, is pointing us back to what came before. The words, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. So this, therefore, is hinged on Jesus having all power and authority, therefore. And then the rest of the sentence follows. So what came before was Jesus' plenary authority to dispatch and to delegate power to those of his followers that were there, 11 of them, that would be involved in spreading the good news, teaching, instructing, and so forth. Now, in the Latin version, called the Vulgate, the, the word for teach is a word docete. And why I ca that caught my attention is docere, the word docere, from which it comes from, in the Latin, put a little arrow right there, uh, is causative of desere, to show, to teach, to cause, to know. So between verse 19 and 20, we have these two words in English being translated teach and teaching, but as you can see, they are two different words and their value. So without getting into too much detail, some of you already know what these letters mean, but I have what's called morphologically tagged, which means every part of speech, Greek has a lot, of, um, a lot of parts to it. So this is simply, very simply put, it's a verb in the imperative. We'll just keep it simple, okay? Imperative means do it, not discussable, not may you, let, let us do it, go do it. So what Jesus is saying is because of the power and authority I've given you, you go teach people. You go make 
followers, learners of me, Christ. Now, this first word, if you're interested, it is Strong's 3100, if you are interested. And in the intransitive, sorry to do this, but there are people who actually like grammar, not grandma, all right? Uh, so in the intransitive means to be the disciple of one, to follow his precepts and his instruction. In the transitive, to make a disciple, to teach, to instruct. So you get the idea. There is nothing here in this instruction except to teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. So that begs the big question. What would this burgeoning church do as the church was growing every day? New situations were popping up where they didn't have our Lord to say, go and do this or go and do that. Now you've got a problem. Because what you have is you have converted Jews and you've got converted Gentiles. The converted Jews are going to always revert back to type and go back to legalism. And the Gentiles have no frame of reference. So what do you do? And that, that's where the problems seem to start. I'm talking about the big problems. So let me also just say it's interesting because if you write this word out, at least the first few sounds, you have our word for mathematics actually comes from this word, mathetusite, which uh, just thought, interesting relationship to the word, but what you would, if you were to look this word up and you were to look it up in all the languages available, it basically comes back to the concept of disciple and that is either masculine or feminine. Yes, there is actually a reference to a feminine disciple in the Bible. Don't even go, that's impossible, go find it, okay? Don't ask me if you can't, if you're not smart enough to look it up, don't argue with me. <laughs> I'm, I'm really, seriously folks, I get really tired of this. I put a lot of hours into what I do and I research things backwards and forwards. Because when somebody says, I have trouble believing that, well, I've been fine. That's your problem, not mine. Uh, I tell you, go, don't take my word, go and verify what I'm telling you. That's the most important thing you could do for yourself until you finally, maybe I'll build up enough track record for some of these. Okay, I don't, that's enough, I don't need to. But let me tell you, there are two interpretations. Let me get a new page, new page. You wanna save that, okay, new page. So there are two interpretations on this word as follows. Uh, a scholar named Watkins who made a large contribution to the study of words, especially in this particular verse, said, this word is from deser, to learn from the, gosh, some of you are going to hate me, from the Proto-Indo-European of, if you were to look this up, I told you I love languages, Dek in the Proto-Indo-European, to take or to accept, but another group of scholars, Barnhart and the likes, uh, Klein, say it is from a lost compound of disipere, to grasp intellectually, to analyze thoroughly from this and capere put together. So the interesting thing is this, if you were using that uh, prefix, this is a part opposite uh, asunder Caperi to take hold of from the, again, from a root of to grasp. So how did we get to the Catholic records where everybody's a pope? So the first pope, according to Catholic records, is Peter. Now, if I ask you to comb through the scriptures and find the word pope, Oh, it's there. It's, it's just in a different form. Papa or papas in the Greek. When Jesus says, call no man father. Let me elaborate. I haven't done this and I'm sorry, I should have. If you read that passage, it makes it abundantly clear he's not talking about your earthly father. That's your father. Your earthly father is your father. He was talking to religious Pharisees and scribes when he said, call no man father. Why? Because in that passage he says, they love to be called by their titles, rabbi. They love to have all the attention and the elevation. 
it was on this premise that he said, call no man father, that no one is elevated except for our Lord and Savior. And he even elevates the Father above him, even though they are equal in the Godhead. So think about this. Many times we will have, they're, in, they're ingrained, uh, the interpretation of what I just told you, call no man father. And if you look in the Greek, father, papas, which is translated pope, papa, father, pope, they're all related, they're all the same word. And then fast forward to the implementation of priest being called father. Now, these are people who study this book, and I don't care if they're studying the Catholic book, that passage is in the book. So how did we get a whole swath of society, father so-and-so, father so-and-so, father so-and-so. Why? The Bible clearly says to not do that. And you say, well, go on a Catholic forum, catholic.com. You will find all kinds of interesting topics there, and you might end up just shaking your head. Not because, this is not an anti-Catholic statement. This is scripture. And as I said, I don't care if you're reading the Dewey version, which was designed to be the Catholic Bible. I don't care if you're reading that version. Remember, English is English. You've got to go back to what the original says. Greek is Greek, and that's what's going to matter. So when Jesus said, call no man father, he was talking to the religious people of his day. Then the argument comes, well, then why should a pastor be called a pastor? Because Paul said God gave some pastors, evangelists, shepherding teachers, to do something, to teach, to instruct, to build up, to perfect the saints, to the work of the ministry. So I don't care how you want to parse what I'm saying. The main function of every pastor, any person standing in the pulpit, is to teach, not even to preach, to teach, to instruct, to give an expository concept, maybe it's a word study, but teaching of any kind is what we have been charged to do. Anything else in the church, and I'm not opposed to music, music should be in the church, but it can't be the primary thing. And I've seen people who focus on, as I, I've cataloged this before, the social issues, the, it's everything else, but what am I being taught? Now, if you go to a university, what's the first thing you look at? The curriculum for what you desire to study. Why do we treat the church any different? Especially when you're reading what Jesus told his disciples to do. And somewhere along the line, those words have been released. We're not, I am not seeing people becoming followers by learning about Christ. I'm just seeing the modern church caught up in how can I attract the people and how can I keep them happy and pleased? You find your happiness in the Lord. The joy, my joy, the Bible says, comes from the Lord. And I don't read anywhere, if I'm going to take my pattern from Christ, I don't read anywhere that Christ tried to please the masses. Did he? No. I, I didn't hear you. Did he? No. That's what I'm talking about. So here's the thing. It takes mental effort, right? It takes, it takes the brain to be engaged. And... I think there's an objective. If you read this passage, it's pretty clear. Make learners, teach them about me, and make learners which will become followers, which eventually, from disciples, will become sent ones as well. And that's how the church grew in its early stages. So, the other word, let's go back. This other word here, the dascunte. Strong's 1321, if you're interested, so you can look it up. Strong's. Defined as such, absolutely to hold discourse with others in order to instruct them, deliver didactic discourses to become a teacher, straight out of Romans 12, 7, to discharge the office of a teacher, to conduct oneself as a teacher, according to regular use with the accusative case used of Jesus and of the disciples, offering in public what they wanted their hearers to know and to remember. 
We can also use this word to convey the thing taught or simply to teach someone. So let me ask you a question. In what I've just done with these two words, can you, in all honestly, in all honestly, honesty, tell me that the whole church is actually doing what Jesus said? No. They're not. And that's where we go off track. Now, even if we're teaching, say all the pastors are teaching and they're, they're doing what they're supposed to do, that will not stop heresies from creeping in. All you've got to do is look at the early church. And we've gone over this, the story of Christmas and how the early church was so perturbed that it couldn't stop the celebration of the pagan celebration of the Saturnalia. So if you can't beat them, join them. And they just grafted that pagan holiday onto a date, which, by the way, if you want to look, look up this research, it, that date actually has value to something else, but not in Christianity. It is not the birth date of Christ. I can prove that to you. I have in past messages. In fact, I don't want to prove it to you. Go find the message that I delivered on it, and you'll see what I'm saying is true. You can actually trace the courses of the priests to determine the approximate time when Jesus was born. Why? Because John the Baptist was born just a bit before him, and we can pin all that down properly. So in the early church, they saw this coming from a mile away, but they decided it's better to just bring the people in. Just let's keep bringing them in. It doesn't matter. Instead of educating them and stopping what has been propagated as Listen, somebody says, well, what's the harm in celebrating Jesus' birthday on December 25th? You know, it really doesn't matter. Well, I'll tell you what, friend, if you celebrate my birthday on December 25th and my birthday is not for another couple of months, I'm going to think you're a lunatic. I'm going to think, what the hell's wrong with you? Don't you know me? Are you my friend? Don't you know when I'm born? Did you not even bother to do a little digging? That's the same thing with Jesus. So somebody says, well, what does it matter? As long as you're celebrating, it matters. But I've always said, the birth is not as important. He could have been born like any other child, and every mother in Israel thought they were going to give birth to the Savior. But if he didn't come to do what was prophesied, and if he didn't die, resurrect, and ascend, eh, then we have a problem. But he did. So, we're also told to go into all the nations. Disciples no more just to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And I want you to let that sink in, because we don't even talk about this anywhere. Remember, that was the charge for the disciples. Lost sheep of the house of Israel. Do not immediately think, well, that's just implying they're all Jews. They're not. We've covered this before. But it would have been, in that day and age, insinuating that a good chunk of these may have been. Don't go to them anymore. They had their chance. They, th those that heard and received good, and those that didn't, well, what does it say? He came to his own, and his own received him not. And when it says his own, he's talking about the lost house of Israel, his own. That's what that reference is to. So, with this charge of them being sent, they are known now as apostles, sent ones. And so the learner, as I said, becomes an apostle, and this is the idea behind missionaries. You don't just decide one day I'm going to go be a missionary, you have to have the knowledge first, and then you can pass that knowledge on. You'd be a sent one, an apostle. My only grievance with that in this day and age is when I hear somebody calling themselves apostle, mm, there's just a little something weird about that, but probably is more biblical than most things I hear in the church. Okay, um, so we were never supposed to wait, just based on this text, we were never supposed to wait for the world to come to Christ. And, and that sounds a little bit weird the way I just said that. He said, go ye into all the nations, and your job is to get out there. And they did, by the way. <laughs> they, they certainly did. But the reason why I bring this up is because, if you remember at the opening of this message, I mentioned Wycliffe, John Wycliffe, and his Bible. That was his version of bringing the message to the masses, was putting it in the tongue, that the common man could understand, 
read and know. I mean, we, we tend to think not everybody was able to read in that day, many illiterate people, but the ones that could, could do it in their own tongue, which means people who spoke the English language could hear and listen to somebody read the word and not go, you know, we have to assume that everybody was a master of Latin. And yes, there was a time when Latin was the lingua franca of the world, but it died out. So um, kind of important to see that they condemned Wycliffe for actually fulfilling, if you want to think about it, what Christ had to do. Don't you think that there's a problem there? I mean, they said, well, you put the Bible into the most corrupt, heretical language that ever existed, English. As far as I'm concerned, you can apply that to Latin, <laughs> okay? <laughs> Just saying, but if you know the story of Wycliffe, not only was he condemned and ostracized, but it wasn't enough to then basically heap more hatred on him. And we'll, we'll get to it. If you don't know the story, I don't want to ruin it for those that don't know the story. But my point is, it was the church, the Catholic church, that condemned Wycliffe for actually doing the thing that, if you want to say in type, fulfills teaching all nations, making, how do you make a learner? How do you make a follower of Christ? Well, you've got to teach them about Christ. You've got to tell them about Christ. You've got to explain certain things. And how do you do that if people don't understand in the tongue that they, they know? So he's condemned for that. And that's what I'm saying to you. If you begin to see where these messages will go, I want to show you just how off keel we've gone. And when I said to you in the opening statements, do I think that somehow the church needs reformation? Absolutely. We need to stop looking at the church. You know, you see all these people, what I call lifestyles of the rich and famous pastors. They are, okay? Um, I have to do this right. Should I care if I offend somebody right now? <laughs> Let me give this some thought. No. So we used to know, yeah, somebody said, go for it. We used, to, we used to know somebody who had a ministry called Living Well Ministry until we found out they were living well off of other people. Yes. Okay. Like, not the living well, living well, right? Depends on your emphasis. That's what I'm talking about, Reformation. I'm talking about we need teachers to teach. We need people to roll up their sleeves and say, this is the instruction of the world, and the world needs Jesus Christ right now more than anything. We need the strength. We need the healing power. We need salvation. We need deliverance. But that's not going to come by a rock concert and waving our hands. The, the words might be great, but they're not going to give enough meat for the body or for the soul. And having somebody just deliver what I call a skyscraper message, story on top of story that goes nowhere, doesn't, doesn't instruct anything. And yet the masses go for that. No, I was sitting with, I might have told you this, I was sitting with a young minister not too long ago. And this young minister said, you know, I, I don't know if the ministry that I've been given, if it'll ever grow, because it seems like people are not interested in learning. And I just, all I could do was sit there and smile. Because, trust me, uh, not just my 18 plus years of ministry, but everything that I saw before being in the pastorate tells me that there are people that come to church for, even this church, not now maybe, I'm praying not now, but years ago people came for different reasons. And I don't even want to catalog them because most of you know the reasons, all right? So all I'm telling you is, God is great, much greater than we attribute. So he knows our motives. He knows our intent. He knows the actions of the heart. And that specifically tells me if somebody is not willing to put in the work in the pastorate to teach, to give instruction, they shouldn't be there. And you shouldn't sit and listen. Because if, if everything that we're doing here is preparation for eternity, 
How are you being prepared when you're basically being told, goo goo, gaga, here, stick a spoon in your mouth and go home, feel good about what happened today? That's not going to do it for me. And I don't think it does it for any of you listening to me. I think the thing I'm grateful for is I have a thinking congregation, people that don't mind stretching their brains and thinking outside the box. And then you can come back in the box and go, OK, it's good. It's OK, right? So let me get back to the message now. So just to take some information here. And I'm going to use a very interesting person to do this, John the Baptist. Now, if you remember, John the Baptist was not a follower of Christ. He had his own group around him, but he is called the forerunner. Okay? He went before Christ, basically heralding and telling people, you know, the kingdom of heaven is coming. It's at hand, right? But if you look at what he actually was talking about, in the few verses that are relegated to him, you can find up to 30 subjects that are defined and immediately they are doctrinal in nature. Repentance, and I, I, I have the chapter and verse, but you can look them up for yourselves. Repentance, kingdom of heavens at hand, prophecy, water, baptism, restitution, uh, godliness, wrath to come, against pride, miracles, heaven and hell, spirit baptism, first advent, second advent, judgment of sin, salvation, loving others, honesty, absolute justice, Jesus is the Lamb of God, Jesus' spirit baptizer, Jesus is Son of God, Jesus' sin bearer, the unworthiness of mankind, Jesus the bridegroom, the greatness of Christ, Jesus from heaven, the rejection of Jesus, Jesus is the truth, Jesus as the anointed one, Jesus is heir of all things. And that's just to give you an idea. I'm sure I didn't put all of them down. And that's from someone who got just a little face time in the Bible, just a little bit. And that's all the, we'll call, although they're, they're not elaborated on, they're there. And that's what I'm talking to you about. Now, isn't it interesting that someone who didn't necessarily have the time and the exposure to Jesus obviously was inspired by God through the Holy Spirit to get out there and proclaim. But he didn't go out there and say, hear ye, hear ye, the greatest musician is about to approach into Jerusalem. You all better get in line, get a ticket. The show is going to be great. <laughs> okay. Some of you didn't get that. <laughs> I'm tired of people not thinking, period. I'm tired of people not thinking, not using their brain. They come to the church, oh, I'm just going to sit here. Some, some with their eyes rolling in the back of their head, falling asleep, <laughs> mouth is open. Try that in any classroom. You'll be expelled real quickly. A teacher looking at an open mouth, somebody with their head back, is really kind of frustrating. And people that want to come into the church and say, well, you ought to be doing this, and you ought to be doing that. Everything but what we're actually supposed to do based on what Jesus said. So let me ask you a question. Do you think, and it's, just an, it's a silly question, but do you think if Jesus was standing right behind me right now, he'd say, I disagree with her. We should have fun here. We should play games and do lots of music. Or do you think he'd be saying, that's what I said. Thanks for repeating it. Because that's what he said. That's what I'm getting tired of. People treating the church like it's a game, like, oh, I'll go when I want to go. I, I don't feel like it. Or I might. Or, oh, is there going to be a good group there today? Or what do you, th what, do you think? Pastor's going to talk about something that I'm going to like? Yeah. Okay, so first off, the mission of the church is to teach people the message of God's word. And if that is so, how did we end up with things that are nowhere to be found in the scriptures? You know, you're going to see where this message is going. You're going to be like, what? Because I'm just getting started and I'm running out of time. So take the one that I've spoken out against many times. I'm just going to give this as an example. The elevating of Mary to be above Christ, superior to Christ, pray to and worship. Please, please, please find this in this book. 
challenge to drive you crazy because you won't find it. There are two references to Mary. One is Elizabeth basically saying, who are you, who am I that you'd come into my house? You are blessed of God and the child in your womb will be greatly blessed. And another statement that's made, blessed are the paps that give suck, basically blessed is this woman and her child. There is nowhere, not anywhere in this book where we have anything where Mary is venerated. In fact, before I go down my, my pathway, I'm going to give you an example from the website catholic.com. Okay, the article, so if you want to look it up, the article is under the Bible says Mary is the mother of God, dated 8-11-2020. I always give credit and reference, so there you go. It is in the form of a question and answer from a caller into their program. The caller says, when praying to Mary or Hail Mary, isn't that idolatry? And the host answers as follows. Bear yourself for this answer. Brace yourself. It's going to be good. The host first says to the caller, great question. Yeah, that's filler right there. And then goes on to say, Mary is the mother of God because it's a historical fact, and also it's found in the New Testament in John's writing. Okay, but here's where it gets interesting. Now I'm going to quote what came from that article, and it's a direct quote off the website, so if you go look at it, you'll see this. Scripture tells us in Luke 1.43, St. Elizabeth says of Mary, and I find this also interesting that they put St. Elizabeth, but they didn't put St. Mary. If you're going to do it to one, you've got to do it to both. But anyway, after she had conceived, Jesus goes, uh, after she had conceived Jesus, she goes to the house of Elizabeth and quote, who am, I, uh, who am I that the mother of my Lord should come unto me? And of course, she is referencing under the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm, re I'm reading, quoting from that website. When David said of the Ark of the Covenant, who am I that the Ark of my Lord should come unto me? And so we know the scriptures here are revealing Mary to be the new Ark of the Covenant, just as the Old Testament, the Ark of the Covenant, uh, you know, was, was depicting God. Now, here's my interesting... It's interesting how God does things, time things. So in my office, you put these in my office, John, or somebody does? This was in the stack um, just in my office just now. So com complete coincidence. <laughs> this is from YouTube. And I, I don't mean, by the way, to uh, this is not to abase you for this person who wrote this, but they were listening to the message on the Ark of the Covenant that I preached. And they said the word Ark means box or the container that housed and carried the sacred items and wherein dwelt the Lord God himself. No, he didn't dwell in the box. I'm sorry. Uh, I think I spelled that out clearly. There were three things in the box, and God wasn't one of them. <laughs> it is clearly a precursor or type representing the Blessed Virgin Mary who did the same for Jesus as the Mother of God. So they're saying that this person saying that Mary, just like this Catholic person, this Catholic.com is saying Mary was the Ark. Uh, you know, here's the deal. If, that's why I said you've got to study the whole, the whole book because that box was made of acacia wood and gold, symbolizing his divinity and his humanity. And Mary was nothing but 100% human. So, you know, this is the problem. You go to a source where you think, oh, I'm going to learn something, and you're, you're learning stuff. All right. I'm sorry. I got to figure out ways to say things without saying them. And I got to be careful because this is really, it's, it's frustrating that people who read the book twist the scriptures. And then you've got innocent people that will go and look for answers and they, they come across, oh, that, that makes sense. To a person who does not know all the teaching that I did on the tabernacle, that might make sense. Mary is, Mary's the box. No, Mary's box and Mary the box, no. No, we're not doing that, okay? And I gotta, I gotta like leave that alone right now. All right, we know that Jesus was the shadow and type of the Ark of the Covenant, as per the multiple messages I delivered to you. And 
the Ark of the Covenant has not one iota to do in shadow or type with Mary at all. To give you an idea, Mary, the mother of Jesus, is mentioned five times in Matthew, 12 times in Luke, one time in Mark, once in the book of Acts. Yet the Catholic Church has chosen to elevate her above Jesus, making her mediator, and teaching that after Mary died, she was taken up to heaven like Jesus, physically and spiritually. But this was made official dogma by Pope Pius XII in 1950 AD. Do you want me to repeat that? Because I don't know if you, were, you were actually heard what I said. How can you make doctrine in the year 1950 AD? Uh, okay, hold on a second here. Like 50 years ago, we just decided that that's the truth. When people have been studying this book for how long? Okay. This is what I'm talking about. And I've said this before. I have many Catholic friends. I don't do this because I hate Catholics or I hate Catholicism, I do this because I am going to proclaim, I'm going to speak the truth in love. And if it makes people mad, that's fine. But read this book before you start throwing your insults or your vitriol at me. Read this book and tell me that you can find anywhere where Mary is elevated. In fact, if anything, she is abased at the marriage of Cana. <laughs> She's trying to tell Jesus what to do and he basically puts her in her place. Then there's the time where Mary comes with the other kids, and they, they say, Jesus, your mother and your brethren, they're there. And he says, who is my mother and who are my brethren but those that do the will of the Father? There is no place where she is venerated. In fact, she's just one of many women standing at the foot of the cross. She's one of many in the upper room. And in fact, if you go to the book of Acts, it says Mary, the mother of Jesus, and the other Mary and the brethren were all praying together. And they weren't praying to her. They were praying to God. So how do you get to this corner? You can't get to it from this corner. This is what I'm talking about. Here's another one for you. Mary, as mother of God incarnate, she was without the stain of original sin from her own conception. That's an interesting one. So you want to tell me, okay, our faith is based on the virgin birth? Yeah, that's a, that's a hard one to comprehend, but okay. But that is the genesis of our faith, not that Mary was from the beginning. And again, this is, try and find this in this book. You will not find it. So my question is, how, how much man made, and I don't mean men in particular, but mankind, how many humans have said, this needs to be added on, we make it doctrine, and then we all go our happy way? So it's a concern. Um, it was Pope, Pope Pius IX who authorized the idea in 1854 as a uh, church dogma, Mary without sin, and Mary without original sin from her conception. So, you know, I don't know how you, how you add these things later when they're not even in the book or how you come to that conclusion. Oh, you know, the Lord spoke to me and the Lord told me, yeah, a lot of people do that and a lot of people say a lot of crazy things. It shouldn't necessarily become church dogma. Do you get what I'm saying? Yeah. If we really care about God's word, then we ought to care that we're sticking. I'm not a legalist. I'm not a fundamentalist, but we should care that we're sticking to what's in this book and things that are added even John said, no one should add or take away. So the institution that's supposed to be teaching people will not even read the message that says don't add and teach. Don't add, just teach. Let me tell you what the Bible doesn't say. It doesn't say that they prayed to Mary. It doesn't say she was elevated. It doesn't say that she was anything and I've said this before, and I don't mean to be blasphemous, she was used as the holy incubator. If you want to put something holy on it, she was the holy incubator. God chose her a specific junction in time from a certain lineage between her, and it, it's actually, this is very interesting. The Jewish people who refused to acknowledge Christ, and yet we know, you read, Jesus was a Jew, came to his own, his own received him not. And, you know, you read about, and I covered this before in our Lost Tribes teaching, about how modern Judaism is caught up in the idea 
that as long as the mother is Jewish, but the whole Bible is patriarchal. And with the exception of Mary being highlighted, the whole Bible is patriarchal. We don't have much information on Joseph, but this, that's an anomaly per se. So again, well, where did this come from? And now I'm not targeting the Catholics, I'm asking the Jews. And they could say, well, this is how it has to be. I was reading on a very silly forum, uh, somebody posted something and I, I just couldn't resist, I had to chime in there. I try not to, but I had to, because this person put such nonsense out there. First of all, there is no Jewish DNA. Can you get over this? There are haplogroups. <laughs> there are haplogroups. When you do DNA, there are haplogroups that people who identify as Jews, specifically those from the house of Judah, may have, but they are so few because you've got a dispersion of people from everywhere. <laughs> this person said there's such a thing as Jewish DNA. Uh, okay, let's get this straight. Judaism is a religion. It is not a race. Christianity is a religion. It is not a race, unless you consider yourself the new race in Christ, but that, that takes a Christian to understand that. Okay, so there's enough nutty things here that I say to you the important thing is... Okay, I've got to give you one more because I just looked at my notes and I'm saying I'm missing one here. Matthew 2.11 says, They saw the child with his mother Mary and they bowed down and worshipped him. So, now don't just say, well, that just happens in the Catholic Church because it's happening in Christian denominations where you've got such bad theological exposition of things that no wonder why people are confused. No wonder why people are what? what they'll say things that don't make any sense. I'm just going to go with what's in here. That's, that's, there's enough in here for us to know. And, and when we get between the years 100 and 325 away from the eyewitnesses to Jesus, you'll see how things speed up exponentially to graft things onto the church because people didn't stop and say, wait a minute, maybe we shouldn't be having this discussion about this. Is this a social issue or a church issue? Remember that in antiquity, everything was kind of twisted together. You didn't have a church life. Your whole life was spiritual, everything all at once. So the importance here is to understand why, when I go back to our text to make learners and to teach, the idea here is that we are doing that. And there is no way you are, you are not going to learn about who Jesus is by osmosis. You are not going to learn God's ways by hearing somebody, although it may be beautiful. I love the song Amazing Grace. And yes, it tells, it tells a testimony for anyone who has been touched by God. But even that is not going to help you understand in its entirety. You've got beautiful hymns of the church. They are not going to fill out the picture for you. And I don't care if they're done in classic or if they're done in modern or techno. It's still not going to help you learn about Christ. So as a pastor, that's what I'm concerned about. As a pastor, I'm concerned that if the primary activity of the church based upon the words of Christ is that, then yeah, we're due for a reformation. We're due just like if, if as citizens of this country, if we were really honest with ourselves, I know I've been in the correctional facilities. That all needs to be changed. Oh, they're going to change it now, but it'll be for the wrong and for the worse. Our whole justice system needs to be changed. We need reformation there. We need reformation in so many places. We need a government reformation. But before any of that happens, we need the church to get back to its calling, and we need the people to stop every person that's tuned in and listening, to stop acting like this is what we're here for. And like I said, if you're not listening to me, if you say, you know, I get it, you're very committed, but you're not my cup of tea, then you find someone who is teaching, who is your cup of tea. Now, from what I just said, and I've repeated this before, you can tell that I care more about your soul, whether you get it from me or someone else teaching you real substance, 
than you just feeding yourself a bunch of garbage. It's like, it's like eating Doritos, right? Oh, man, they're good. And they stain your fingers, right? Until you find out that you turn the, 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 the bag around, and if you read the ingredients carefully, you just consume petroleum. Oh, that's so tasty. Yeah, it's true, by the way. But anyway, that's a story for another day. So let me finish the message and close the message out with this. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Two things pop in my head. There's a long list, but two pop in my head. The first one, which he gave as a command, which I've repeated ad nauseum. You should know this one. How will they know that we are your followers? that you have love for one another, agape love, not phileo. And he basically, in two places in John, commands them to do so. That's one. The next one, you can say it is what it is, but think about this. He tells his disciples, follow me. I'll make you something you're not. Follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. Now, they had a choice. That wasn't necessarily a command, but they had a choice. But they left, they, it says, they straightway forsook their nets, and they followed him. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. How about the table of the Lord? How about that? And look at the perversion of this. The act in the New Testament is a simple act. It wasn't some high ceremonial procedural, you got to go take a shower and turn in circles five times, genuflex, pray that somebody will see that you are virtuous and good enough to be able to be a candidate to take communion. Oh, there are people that go to churches where you have to take a course before you can ever take communion. Does, does that sound right to you? Does that sound biblical? Because the only course you need is to know about what Christ did and, and do what Paul said. To look at what you're doing and basically looking to the elements, not looking at them so that they might change into something else, looking to them as a reminder of Christ's ultimate sacrifice, body and blood. Now you tell me how we got to uh, I need to take courses until I can qualify. The priest needs to administer it to me. We have Jesus sitting with his disciples, and it says he broke the bread and he passed the cup because it's Jesus. But I guarantee you, if you read when Paul is quoting this and he's talking about this, do this in remembrance of me, he didn't make it some high liturgical act. He made it something you do in the home. You can do it at church. You don't need someone to administer to you. You don't need someone to be in between you and God when you sit and you are understanding what you're doing. That's why we play communions on the network around the clock. It means you can be in your home. You listen to the teaching. You partake the elements. That's all. And to make it anything more than that is to rob the believer, to rob the person of the very thing Jesus said you ought to do. So this is, these are the things that I want us to really look at. And if, if I have people listening to me that can open up their hearts and a Bible, those two things need to be open. You will see that we have gone so far away from what's in here that the idea, that's why I started thinking, Martin Luther, well, now you've got to keep going back to see all of the effects of not checking oneself and not adhering to the book, but coming about with ideas and dogmas and theological ideologies which do not even line up with this book, and then have so many adherents who, I'm sorry to say it like this, but do you not read? I'm, I'm, I'm asking this. You have so many adherents. I don't know how many Catholics there are worldwide, but do you not does anybody in the Catholic Church read this book? Because if you did, you'd find out that there's a lot of stuff that you're being indoctrinated with. Now, I'm not just picking on the Catholics. There's a lot of Protestant churches that are doing other stuff. And that's why it's important to have someone teach, to become a learner, and to study the Word. Now, I'm suggesting if we're genuinely interested in learning, 
start with learning the truth from the book itself. And as I said, maybe the idea, it worked in the Dark Ages. You could propagate anything in the Dark Ages because most people couldn't read and you couldn't get your hands on a Bible if you tried. The Bible was one per parish, per church, if you were lucky, chained to the lectern for the person, whoever that was, the priest or whoever, to be able to read from if they did indeed read at all. Because we also know that many of those priests were illiterate and couldn't read. So you go figure out how you're going to teach people when you can't read. So it's no wonder why when we look at this, the question to be asked is what happened? What happened to the church and why you know, you say, oh, this, this great movement, people are coming to the Lord now, and there's all these different uh, gatherings happening, even here in California. But here's what's happening in these gatherings. Lots of music, lots of praise God, I'm not against that, but very little substance for people to walk away with and have something actually tangible. The moment of emotions and of emotiveness will pass from being caught up in great music or entertainment or a crowd of people who are like-minded, that will all pass. And when all of that passes, what are you left with? I had a great time. That's going to take you to heaven, right? That's what I thought. So um, the question, we'll keep asking, what happened? And we're going to try and keep answering this until the answers become clear that through church history, and I want to take us on this journey, through church history, don't think boring, because it's not boring at all. It's actually very salacious and very hoo-hoo-hoo. But uh, when you get into it, you realize it's a marvel. It's a miracle that some form of identity with the early church even exists at all. We have, be we have morphed the church into something it was never intended to be. I could go on and tell you about the idea. Somehow people are of this mindset that the church its sole mission is charity. Did I not read to you what the mission of the church is? Make disciples. And Paul wasn't confused. Paul was a zealous Jew before he got converted to Christianity. He wasn't confused about this. As plain as day, he understood what teaching means, and that's what he did. All of his letters are, they are either corrective or instructive. That's all. So uh, hopefully you don't think this is going to be history in 1784. It's not that type of history. In fact, if most people really get into church history, it would make for great Hollywood drama. But you'd have to actually look at what's in there. It's got uh, sex, it's got debauchery, it's got everything that you could possibly imagine would never be in the church. It's there. So if you're interested, come back next week. That's my message. You've been watching me, Pastor Melissa Scott, live from Glendale, California at Faith Center. If you would like to attend the service with us Sunday morning at 11 a.m., simply call 1-800-338-3030 to receive your pass. If you'd like more teaching and you'd like to go straight to our website, the address is www.pastormelissascott.com.